Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Crawley, and I'm happy to welcome you to this um, plenary session on the Affordable Care Act, Opportunities and Challenges at the State and Local Level. Um, we're going to try to really um, dedicate most of our time today um, to a question and answer discussion with all of you. So we waited a second because you can see that they um, set it up mi microphones around the room. There, there are three. There's one right here in front. There's a second one back on my left side. And then on my right side, there's, there's a third microphone. But we are going to get some opening um, comments from, from our panelists. And so we're going to begin with Steve Boswell with Fenway Health. Steve? Thank you for having me. Um, sorry for my voice. Uh, I seem to have lost it last evening, so uh, I'll do my best. Uh, so I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about Massachusetts uh, history. For those of you who don't know, Massachusetts is a little bit ahead of the uh, curve of the Accountable Care Act. Um, in 2006, uh, the state passed legislation that would, in essence, guarantee that, that all people who were legally within the bounds of Massachusetts had access to health insurance. Obviously, there were many issues in, in how you go about doing that, but as we sit here today, we have 98.5% uh, or thereabouts uh, of our entire uh, population insured uh, within Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, about 90% of those uh, individuals have actually hooked up with a primary care uh, clinician. Now, we set up exchanges, much as many of the states are now doing, and the exchange operates uh, relatively well. We can go into more detail about how that exchange actually operates within Massachusetts. Uh, but the exchange itself does uh, carry with it certain um, benefits that accrue to, uh, to people with, who access insurance. For those people who are up to 150% of the federal poverty level, they can actually access uh, virtually uh, paid for uh, insurance for people up to 300% of the federal poverty level, which is slightly different than the ACA, um, they can actually, actually access um, uh, subsidized uh, insurance. So it, it looks very similar uh, to what we're seeing in the Accountable Care Act with some specific uh, differences. Now, what that did was get everybody access to insurance. It did almost nothing to address the costs. The only thing that was put in place in 2006 to address costs was something called limited network plans, which basically means that the uh, uh, provide, uh, payer actually negotiates with providers for a limited number of people who a patient can access to get care. And they hopefully are in a coordinated network, although in Massachusetts that has not always happened. Um, the problem uh, with that kind of an approach, as you can imagine, is it, it can, um, for patients, if someone negotiates, if the state, for example, negotiates one year for a limited network plan, uh, and then next year uh, negotiates with one set of providers, next year negotiates with the second set of providers, it can really create a great deal of, of concern for patients in terms of their ability to access mm -hmm. the same plan if their prior, provider one year is in the plan and, and the next year is not. So uh, as of uh, August of this year, we actually passed the final piece uh, of all of this, and that was a health care cost uh, containment piece, uh, which uh, took, uh, if you count the years, six years to actually get uh, passed. And that actually uh, creates something like uh, an ACO-type model for care where prospective payment is actually provided to a group of providers who actually uh, agree to coordinate care uh, with a flat uh, adjusted payment. Now, uh, like limited network plans, these kind of capitated plans uh, carry with it significant concern, uh, and I'll give you an example of just one. Um, as it relates to HIV, and I would argue to some extent hepatitis C, we know relatively, uh, m most of these plans are what are called risk adjusted. That is, they use age, sex, race, uh, uh, a number of different factors, depending on the kind of model that you use, to actually estimate what the cost of the care of uh, an individual will be or a group of individuals will be. 
Now, if you think about HIV, we have relatively little experience. Uh, how do you create a, a model for how expensive care will be for an 80-year-old HIV-positive patient when the number of people who are 80 years old and HIV positive is such a small number, we don't have a, an actual uh, actuarially sound method for actually estimating those kinds of costs. So if you're going to risk adjust for HIV, how do you do it in the context of a disease where you have very little experience for people who are getting much older? Yet risk adjustment uh, is going to be a critical part of what we have to do in, in terms of, of uh, preparing for the ACA in the years to come. So I'll leave it at that. Um, and we can answer questions later on. Great, thank you. So our next um, panelist is Linda D. with AIDS Action Baltimore. Linda? And she has a couple slides, so. Just two, I am exhausted. Oh, now we're gonna take two and a half minutes to do this. Great, okay, so. I'm supposed to talk to you about viral hepatitis and uh, how, it, how the Affordable Care Act will help us, opportunities and challenges. And, you know, I remember in the 208 election, we heard about opportunities uh, or crisis, you know, presenting opportunities for us. And I think the word in Chinese is the same for both. So unlike my usual default uh, mode here, I'm going to try and keep the glass half full here. So we've all, <laughs> we've all heard about... Um, uh, what's good about the Affordable Care Act, the pre-existing condition, uh, prohibitions, health care exchanges, the Medicaid expansion, um, the, you know, the, 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 oh, great, I can't see that, though, I'm old. Ah, the um, the uh, Medicare um, uh, uh, prescription benefit plan being more generous and the donut hole being phased out, uh, and um, uh, uh, essential health care benefits, prevention, and public health fund, so, yay. The other thing I think that's good that I haven't heard a lot about here is uh, the navigators and the opportunity for public health, uh, excuse me, uh, community-based organizations to be involved in that. And, you know, when I think of the Affordable Care Act, it's so confusing. I wonder how, you know, lay people or some of our clients and patients are going to be able to, to maneuver this. So I think it's a great opportunity for community-based organizations to get involved with this. And I think that the regs say that you must be a nonprofit organization. So, now the challenges. So this is from um, uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation. If you'll look, challenging the, uh, ACA, no physicians, supporting, and the schizoid challenging and supporting. <clears throat> so, I mean, I'm lucky enough to live in Maryland where we've accepted the Affordable Care Act, the Medicaid expansion, our essential health care benefits are going to be the same as uh, state employees enjoy, but obviously that's not the same for everywhere. So I would like to present this as an opportunity for advocacy. And I think that uh, although this is about state and local, I mean, without federal money, uh, we're not going to be able to do a whole lot of anything. And we all know the position, that the, the climate, that that's all in at this particular juncture. But I think we still have to you know, use um, advocacy methods to to lobby Congress for more money for all of these programs, for prevention for the CDC, for demonstration projects, for linkages to care and treatment and retention in care, hopefully from HRSA, an NIH test and treat initiative, which I think is great for HIV. I'd love to see that same model in HCV and treatment guidelines so that people from, you know, uh, providers from Peoria know the same thing that people know that can go to ASLD. Um, and I think we need not only state coalitions and private coalitions, but uh, we need the drug companies to be involved with this as well. I can't believe I'm saying that, but I'm saying that. Uh, these things are not in order, but I guess <clears throat> where I live oftentimes is the cost of drugs, so I'm putting that first just because I guess that's my prerogative, right? <laughs> Anyway, I think we need not only groups like the Fair uh, Pricing Coalition, which I'm a member of, to beat industry up about pricing and increases in access, but we also need states to come together in clusters to form groups, you know, like a big blue cross or Care First to be able to negotiate with companies about the price of drugs. Um, so we've got private and, co private and um, um, state coalitions there. <clears throat> we also need to have advocacy coalitions for the states. You know, I mean, Medicaid expansion, and most of the states are not, are not, uh, have not embraced that, let's put it that way. And the Supreme Court says 
you don't have to. So that really, that is probably the worst thing about this because they get to do whatever they want still. Uh, and we all know what states we're, we're talking about here. Um, the essential health benefits is really not very strong. The benchmark approach, which again, do what you want. Uh, and there's gonna be an advocacy opportunity, hopefully if I can talk fast enough, we can tell you about, about um, uh, somebody will come to the microphone because I'm out of time and I'll tell you about that. Uh, I've, I've heard a lot to hear about coordinated care models and I'd love to see that including prevention and um, um, uh, you know, team, the team approach to that, the navigators and of course the premium and copay issues. So, you know, I'd love for us to see, now that the Affordable Care Act is here to stay, I'd love to see a community push. We've had community push to understand it, to keep it in place, now to help people access it and have it work for us, for HIV and HCV. Thank you, Linda. Now we'll hear from our next panelist, Jennifer Cates with the Kaiser Family Foundation. Great. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks to the organizers for, for uh, inviting me here. Um, I've been asked to talk about Ryan White and the Affordable Care Act and some of the issues there. And obviously it's a key question that many of us are thinking about. There's the Ryan White grantee meeting is going on right now, which, uh, at, at which this is a big discussion. There's a big community meeting this week about uh, Ryan White and the ACA and the future of Ryan White. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons we're focusing on it now. First of all, uh, this program started as an emergency program to a burgeoning new crisis, and it's become a mainstay of HIV care. Second, um, we know that its role will change. Um, that's a, a given. Third, it's due to be reauthorized, and that always uh, raises the stakes. And ultimately, I think the, the main point is that the goal here is to ensure continuity of quality care for people with HIV through the transition from now until the ACA and after uh, is, it's fully implemented. So the big challenge, I think, facing all of us thinking about this is that there's a lot of uncertainty. At the same time, I think there's a lot we do know, and that's what I want to focus on. First, we know a lot about the populations that Ryan White reaches. We don't know everything we want to know, but we know enough to understand the importance here. We know actually that the majority of Ryan White clients are insured. Not uninsured, but insured. In other words, insurance is not necessarily adequate to get you everything you need. And so the majority of clients receiving services through Ryan White have insurance, but still need Ryan White. We don't expect that to change. Um, and a significant share have no insurance at all, obviously. We also know that even if all states choose to expand Medicaid, um, and as you saw, there are some uncertainties, although that was pre-election and, and now the post-election picture is a little different, but still, um, we don't know. But assuming that all states expanded Medicaid, and with all the other provisions that the ACA brings, there will still be millions of people in the United States without insurance. A new study that the Kaiser Family Foundation put out yesterday found that even if every state expanded with all the provisions, by 2022, there will still be 28 million people uninsured in the United States. Granted, that's a 48% reduction, but it's still a lot, millions of people. If you apply those same estimates to those with HIV, you arrive at about 100,000 people with HIV with no insurance at all, not including those who are underinsured. So in states that do expand, there will be a role, and in states that don't expand, there will be a role. Um, and obviously, the, the key point here in populations, too, is that we know that regardless of this, the ACA will not cover those who are undocumented, and that's a continuing important role played by Ryan White. Second, we know about the services that Ryan White provides, all the wraparound services, all the critical services, um, helping clients navigate, as we heard. Um, and we know that even with expanded coverage, those critical services will still be needed. The uh, essential health benefits package, which will provide a great floor, will not necessarily be sufficient in every state. Um, so there's a lot around services we do know. And lastly, we know uh, that the Ryan White uh, uh, system has created care networks and built capacity that didn't exist before. And it's that capacity and expertise that we hope will continue and needs to continue um, in going forward. So given this, what we don't know is the, we know Ryan White will still be needed. What we don't know is the scope uh, in terms of the populations, where and how much. So key questions going forward would be the timing and the extent of reauthorization given these uncertainties. What will need to change to ensure con continual care and treatment? How to ensure that Ryan White providers are part of new networks? And what can be done in the short and long term to retool Ryan White to make it better at reaching the goals of the strategy and ultimately addressing all stages of the treatment cascade? Because I think that's what we all want. To, putting aside the issues about specific pieces of the legislation or programs in a state. It's really about 
that goal. So I think um, those are some of the things I wanted to put out on the table. Great, thank you, Jen. Now our next panelist is Dr. Donna Sweet, who's with the University of Kansas Medical Center. Donna. Thank you. And thank you for having me up here. I'm going to be brief because I really do want this as a feedback so that you can tell me how you're going to handle some of the problems that I think I have. And I'm here to discuss sort of individual state problems. Um, I'm in Kansas. I've been there my whole practice life. I've been doing HIV for almost 30 years. And we have built a, con a, a continuity of care clinic uh, that serves three quarters of Kansas. and. 30% of my people come with no visible means of health coverage and 33% are 100% of the federal poverty level or less. So we have the same problems that Massachusetts and California and New York have in terms of minority populations, poor populations, increasingly young population which are often uh, uninsured. <clears throat> but we have another big problem that Massachusetts and California doesn't. We are Kansas. And we are one of the states that I, I have no hope that we will expand Medicaid. Um, we are not going to participate in the exchanges. And some people say that's good because we'll have the federal exchange that we can participate in. But we have a huge problem with the ACA. And if there were not continued Ryan White funds, then we have that 30% of people, 100% of the federal poverty level and below to which the ACA does not address. It simply doesn't address that population. They're not uh, subject to the same ability to get into exchanges or to get subsidies. It was expected that they would be covered by Medicaid. So I have that on the one hand. The other hand is that uh, our governor just converted every 90% or more of our Medicaid patients will move into one of three managed care Medicaid programs January 1st. I expect it to be pretty much a disaster in terms of reassigning my patients. Uh, they are, we have signed up for all of them, but they're going to be assigned to various practices. So we're going to see what happens in the shuffle and how many people end up uh, as has happened in California. And I know there's probably some people here who live through that where HIV patients got reassigned to people like pediatricians and ob -GYNs. So uh, we expect to have some of that same problem. So those are some of the state issues that I know many of you are, are facing, and I thought it would be a good opportunity if we could kind of network a little bit about how you are lobbying, helping the advocacy groups figure out how to get to the states to help them understand why expanding Medicaid would be good for the state. So I'm just going to ask for your input, and thank you. Great. Thank you, Donna, and thanks to all of you. Um, it's actually great sometimes when um, things work as planned and people are adherent, and um, they gave some very brief opening comments, but now we really have 30, 40 minutes for um, question and answer. So I invite um, interested people to go to the different microphones and um, come up with your questions. Um, I'm going to just ask a, a first question, though. And you know, as background, Jennifer and I um, worked on a brief on um, the Affordable Care Act um, after the ACA. And one of the things that I thought was important there is that, you know, I, I, we have to worry about Medicaid, but I didn't want people to be overly worried about which states would expand, that there's other things we have to do. But let me ask the panelists here about this Medicaid expansion. I mean, there's some observations that we can make. Whether or not, whatever your governor says, it's unambiguously a good deal for states to expand Medicaid. Whatever your governor or your legislators say, there will be um, cuts in other safety net payments. Disproportionate share hospital payments will be dramatically reduced with, under the assumption that you'll be expanding Medicaid, they'll have a source of coverage. There will be other um, pretty important um, interests in your state that really will be pushing for a Medicaid expansion. So I'm wondering if people have thoughts here on how um, the HIV community can really engage with some of these parties to make sure that as many states as possible actually do expand Medicaid. Uh, well, I'll start. Um, I think it's important to find your allies. Um, in Texas, for example, I think about this uh, not infrequently recently, that uh, Texas has some of the largest uh, medical schools uh, and medical centers in the country. Uh, one of the states that's uh, bucking um, actual Medicaid expansion. So uh, the first thing I would do is go to those medical centers and start to align yourself uh, with them. I, I think Texas is uh, a state that will be unlikely, based on its large um, medical 
professional population uh, and great medical centers uh, to be one of those uh, places where um, um, setting up exchanges or at least participating in exchanges and expanding Medicaid is going to fly. I actually think it's, uh, it, it will happen relatively soon. So two things. Um, I talked about drug company involvement. I mean, I think all drug companies should work with the community in having lobbyists in Washington to talk about these things. Uh, and I mean, they have access that we don't, you know, and they can get, make things happen that we can't for, for obvious reasons. So, I mean, if you'd have told me years ago that I'd be uh, advocating for that, I would have laughed in your face. But we need to be partners now, and there's that. The other thing is I'd like to put a plug in for um, our group called Harbor Path, and I work with the Fair Pricing Coalition, and we have tried to do a uniform forum for people uh, on ADAP programs and uh, working with NASTAD as well. And, um, and now uh, uh, patient assistance sort of program, uh, well, for people that, have been, that fall through the cracks, essentially. So, I mean, I think that's something that also needs drug company involvement so that we can make sure we do have this safety net, especially, you know, once the Affordable Care Act takes place, you know, comes into effect and, and all these people fall through the cracks. I think that sort of a program will be very helpful for meds anyway. Right. Well, I'm... I'm trying to work with the uh, hospital association because there are many hospitals that could be put at significant risk without Medicaid expansion because of the disproportionate share loss that they're going to see. So, and the hospital association is a strong lobbying group in most places. So I, I think that's one place that we can perhaps find an ally as well. I'll just add, because I'm from Kaiser Family Foundation, that data is your ally, and there's a lot of great data out there to um, help make the case about why it's a good investment for states, um, and in many cases, a minimal investment for states. The report I mentioned that came out yesterday that colleagues did has a state-by-state -state breakout, but there's a lot of other resources available, and I, and I just think uh, coalitions coming together using the, those data will really, uh, it, it will be very helpful and beneficial. Can I add one caveat? I just have uh, one caveat. Um, a very wise politician once told me that um, if you're uh, invited to dinner, if you're not invited to the, the table, you're usually on the menu, um, which, which basically means that, that you may want to go with uh, an ally, a medical uh, ally, uh, to the table. But you also have to realize that, that they have different interests than you do. So getting the state to actually engage in this process is one thing. But remember that in many states, what actually gets described as that expansion is going to be different than what exists in Massachusetts or in New York. What are defined as the essential health benefits and any benefits that go beyond that are going to be fairly flexible things because in order to get the states to engage in this process, the, the administration has made a commitment to make this process somewhat flexible with some limitations, and those are the essential health benefits. So the essential health benefits for your partner in this work, like a major medical center, might not be the same essential health benefits or the same benefits that you might argue strongly for. So just be aware that it's good to have them by your side, but remember that all of their interests aren't yours. Actually, I just thought of one other, one other thing. I think there's still some education uh, to be done with, with state officials around what the limitations there are with Medicaid currently. Um, just hammering home the point that people with disabilities, people who are uh, very sick, regardless of how sick they are, as long, if, they, if, if they don't meet a disability criteria and are extremely poor, are not going to get on Medicaid today. And very few states um, have expanded any of their optional coverage to provide them with any coverage at all. So it's a population that we all we're talking about where um, uh, there's no disability determination per se, very poor or low income, and literally cannot get on Medicaid today. And that is an important piece of, of data that I don't I think gets lost a lot in, in the conversation. And just pointing out how many how few states have provided that coverage, and, and that population is really left out of Medicaid. Great. So last comment, Donna. Oh, great. So now we're going to, can you um, introduce yourself? And <clears throat> is there an on? Is there a button or something? Jules Levin. So, comment and a question for Steve Boswell. The comment 
comment is, is that there was just a sign-on letter circulating, but some of us talked about a different sign-on letter or an additional sign-on letter, and that is it's my understanding that Kathleen Sebelius has the power to make hep C screening in A or B grade if she wants to. So I suggest that we have an additional sign-on letter that all of us here sign on to and submit this to her. That's my comment. So my question is for Steve Boswell. Um, so what's your experience with exchanges in Massachusetts? One of the concerns that's been raised is if you have exchanges and then you have private employers that have paid large amounts of money for private insurance and good plans for their employees, that small employers may stop paying for that and make their employees go for exchanges, which may have worse coverage. What's your experience? Uh, we, can, can, we, can you all hear that question in the back? Do we need to repeat it? <laughs> all right, I'm not sure. I feel like I heard yes and no. So I'll qu try to very quickly summarize Jill's comments. His first comment was he understands that Secretary Sebelius has the power to make hepatitis C screening an A or B rating or expand the coverage. And so maybe we need to look at um, doing another sign on letter to encourage that. But then his question to Steve was what is your experience with the exchanges in, in Massachusetts? And he um, raised some concerns that um, there might be a concern that some of the smaller employers might um, drop coverage and put people into the exchange and, and what, what that would look like. So that, that was a, a major concern that we had in 2006 when the law was, was passed, that the creation of these exchanges actually would offer um, opportunities for many employers to actually seek uh, less expensive plans by, going, uh, by uh, sending all of their patients to, uh, to those plans. There is a penalty for doing that, but that penalty may actually be less than actually paying the, the premium. So um, what we have found is that that hasn't happened. In fact, today there are more employers offering, op, offering insurance in Massachusetts uh, than there were in 2006 when the law was created. So at least in our experience, we have not found that to be a major issue. Thank you. No, I can't tell. Is there someone waiting at, at microphone two? Looks like not. Okay, so we'll go back to, to one. Hi, uh, Ryan Clary with the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable. I'll make a comment and ask a question. So I agree with you, Jules. So, um, so as the one who put the document on your table, it's, uh, right now that's collecting names and email addresses of anybody who wants to be a part of responding to the USPSTF's very disappointing draft uh, recommendations around hepatitis C screening of those born between 1945 and 1965 because we only have until December 24th and if we don't act on that, we can't build for what Jules is talking about is, is a, a bigger movement that actually I want to ask Linda about. So um, I welcome anybody who wants to just fill that out and we will um, be in touch with sample letters and all of that. And moving towards a bigger strategy and that's kind of my question is the obviously the viral hepatitis community of movement is behind the HIV AIDS community, especially around implementation of the Affordable Care Act. And I've worked with all of you over the years. And Linda, like me, you've worked in HIV and viral hepatitis. Just wondering some thoughts and recommendations you have from the HIV world on what viral hepatitis advocates can be doing, strategically partnering with HIV advocates with the really very few advocates and resources that we have. Well, you know, I'm from Maryland, and it's funny, in, in Baltimore, for instance, the HIV advocates are the same as the HCV advocates. They run the same organizations, they, it's the same population for the most part. So, um, you know, I mean, we have to put away all the old hoo-ha and work together, period, you know. Um, I think, too, it was, very, it was very interesting for me. I forget Dave had a meeting that I spoke at, and it was, it was interesting, I think, for, for the sum of, some po somewhat, anyway, HBV and the HCV community has come together a little bit. What was interesting for me to see, um, people of Asian descent that were working together with gay people and whatever. So I think, if anything, we need to learn how to work together. Um, which is, you know, it's always hard, but um, I mean, I mean, that's strength in numbers sort of thing. But I think we need in HCV and in HIV, like I said, around this Affordable Care Act, I mean, we need a big advocacy push. I mean, my last line of, of that slide was um, uh, a reference to Harvard Law School's uh, treatment access education project. And, you know, some of that is drug company funded to pump up advocacy in the states. Now obviously it's to sell drugs, but in other words, it still works for getting 
treatment and, and prescriptions written. So that sort of stuff locally. And we need to have a better plan nationally. I mean, there are plenty of HIV advocates that are working in this and are willing, but um, I mean, I think we don't have to reinvent the wheel, I guess, is my best message, and do the same things we did before. It's not rocket science. It really isn't. Well, in specific, your question about what can the hepatitis advocates do, I think um, the essential health benefit package and the language in that, uh, especially surrounding medications, is something that really needs to be watched. We from the HIV side have been very verbal. I don't know whether you've been speaking to the issue of getting those newer drugs uh, on the formulary as they should be. So I think that's a, a, it's a big risk and something that somebody needs to be clamoring about right now. Thank you. The next question. Uh, Tim Horn from uh, the Treatment National Group in New York. Um, I just wanted to build upon something that um, Linda had talked about and actually pose a general query to the uh, entire panel, which is that while the future of Ryan White is, is not clear, I mean, the ink is hardly dry on that. I mean, I, I think we can say beyond a reasonable doubt that we're, moved, we're shifting away from kind of grant-focused care into more reimbursement-focused care. And for reimbursement-focused care, whether we're talking Medicaid or we're talking private insurance, um, that depends on standards of care. It depends on guidelines, which are actually driven by science. Now, for treatment, we've really managed to you know, bang out a, a considerable amount of science to help drive uh, the standards of care around antiretroviral therapy. We know that. What we haven't done, and what we're just beginning to do, is around entry and retention. We just don't have the science to drive the policy that is really dominating a lot of the discussion here. So really, uh, my first point is that there is such a tremendous need for advocacy to drive the science necessary to answer some of the fundamental questions as to how we are actually going to increase entry and retention in care. So my, my, my question is to the panel, and I, I realize this could be probably a, um, a whole other discussion, is like, uh, particularly what is some of the science that you believe is required to address some of these policy um, issues, and importantly, what do you see as the role of advocacy in achieving that science that is necessary? Any takers? You know, I wonder um, if a lot of the grants that people get, I mean, I know they have evaluation components, but I wonder if we really put a, I hate to say this, another, you know, thing that people have to deal with with grants, but, you know, every, every time you give somebody money, maybe we should collect data and, and look at it this way. I mean, what is the benefit to remaining in care? Is there a benefit to remaining in care? If we could prove those things, I mean, this kind of stuff, <clears throat> all sorts of things with, with HCV, is really, there's no information about anything. We don't even know how many people have it. You know, I mean, if we could at every turn try and think about how, you know, look at this task force, you know, not enough data. You know, it's, we need to, to think about all of our programs <clears throat> and evaluation criteria of those programs with those outcomes in mind so that we can, uh, you know, do like a needs assessment as we're going, you know, or not even a needs assessment, but, you know, if you do this, this will happen, and here's the proof. Well, I would say, first of all, I love data, so I think more studies and more science is, are always very great to have. But I also think in this particular case, there's a lot of science there. It's about how it's brought into the policy discussion. And I know you know the science as well, but I, I, the, val the incredible traction that the treatment cascade and the ability to show the linkage, I don't mean linkage to care, but the linkage between diagnosing and viral suppression to policymakers, we shouldn't understate that. And I think going forward, there's a couple things. One is monitoring progress or monitoring indicators along that cascade for whatever programs are working in, whether it's Ryan White, Medicaid, et cetera, has to be more of the focus. In addition, I, you know, a current example of how that science has moved policy is the PEPFAR blueprint that's going to come out on Thursday. This Thursday, Secretary Clinton is releasing a blueprint for PEPFAR based on the new science. And my understanding is that that was advocates who pushed you know, who said to the to the to the uh, to OGAC, we have this new science. We actually need a plan to you to make it work to achieve the goals that we all agree on. And so I think there's a lot there, and it's about adapting 
that information and the science that exists to the current policy discussion, which is happening, but maybe it doesn't, isn't happening at the level that it, it could be. Thank you. Any other questions? Really, you're not going to make me ask questions for the next 20 minutes. I encourage you to go up. But while we're waiting for that, let, let me ask the next question. And um, I think Steve mentioned, I think in some ways other people touched on it. We know that the Affordable Care Act is a, a huge opportunity, but people need more than an insurance card. So when we think about specific populations, whether it's, um, I mean, you can name these young gay men, you know, people that have never had insurance and have no, you know, like all these different people, what is it that we need to really help people once they get an insurance card actually get effectively engaged in care? Are there specific services or things that we need to be doing now to, to make, take advantage of this opportunity? Well, we need a bigger workforce. We, we really need more trained providers and there's, a huge number of the talks here and over at the Ryan White Care um, program that speak to that issue. But we know that of the 4,500 or so skilled HIV providers that are caring for people now, 50% uh, of us are retirable in the next five to eight years. And we have a cap, and sort of another lobbying point, if you're in medical education, you know there's been a cap on residency slots in this country for a long time. We keep opening new medical schools, so we have graduate medical students, but we're not going to have any increased slots for primary care training. So I think putting some emphasis on advocacy for increasing primary care residency slots, increasing the amount of information in traditional training programs that speaks to the issue of AIDS. I think we have to move HIV out of this sort of specialty care bucket, and I know there's people here who disagree with that, but the bulk of our HIV infected individuals with a little help from a specialist can be cared for by good primary care providers. And their problems are their diabetes, their hypertension, their coronary artery disease, the fact that they need their colonoscopy and their immunizations and all the things that primary care people do. So I think we really do have to start shifting towards assuming everybody does get care, who's going to take care of them? Because right now, if you dumped even the 20 million that we think will get exchange coverage into the system, uh, there's not enough providers to absorb all of that in the kind of fashion that it needs to happen. That is, if you test somebody, they need to be in treatment now, not six months from now. The uh, the only other thing I would add to that is it's, it's not just having, we definitely have a primary care shortage uh, in the United States. I think that's not news to anyone. Um, and that shortage is likely to get worse over the next few years rather than, than better uh, as more people move into the system. So they'll remember as the ACA expands the number of patients who now have insurance, uh, any changes in this system that might shift patients from one provider to another basically puts that patient in competition with these new patients entering the system to actually get into uh, primary care. But remember, the way we treat people um, is uh, right now very much an outpatient disease. When I first started taking care of HIV positive patients back in the 80s, it was absolutely an inpatient disease. It was a disease that a resident or intern could learn by the end of their residency most of the nuts and bolts of how to care for somebody who was HIV positive simply based on a hospital experience. The problem is that most of our medical training occurs in that hospital and the disease has now moved to the outpatient setting. So we have very few pay, uh, uh, people in training now who are actually getting the kind of training that's relevant to the care of HIV positive patients today. So one of the biggest issues is how do we expand the training, not just the number of slots, but how do we tailor the training that we're doing in such a way that we actually get more relevant training to the people who can use it. You know, I saw a fascinating presentation this morning by um, Melinda from Harvard again. Linda Elwood, about coordination of care and the team approach. I mean, I think the ECHO program does this, the VA to some extent. I mean, I think we're going to have to learn how to, again, work together in our own hospitals or, or qualified health centers to let whoever can do that more effectively do that while you're doing something else. And some places are better at this than others, but we're really going to have to think outside the box about, about how we're going to get to all these people now. You know, so I think it really, and, and integration, I think, is, is mandatory, not only with prevention programs, but with mental health, uh, with supportive services that a lot of these patients need to, to get in, let alone stay in care, so. 
you. I would just add, in, in, in as an addendum, or not even an addendum, a, another fundamental part of this, beyond the, the uh, ability, having enough providers and, and the quality of the, the, their ability to provide the right care, the biggest problem stepping back from a population level are our linkage to and retention and care. So from that perspective, it's what can we do to get better linkage and better retention and care. That's a great place for Ryan White to have an extreme, you know, a very important role. And I was just thinking about this this morning in regard to some new data that CDC released today looking at 13 to 24-year-olds in the U.S. Um, and new infections among uh, young people. That, that cohort is about a quarter of new infections in the U.S. Most of those new infections are among young gay and bisexual men. So what does it take to get them linked to and engaged in care? And I think that's the big challenge, but also the opportunity presented by the, the knowledge of, of people, of providers and others in the Ryan White Care Network, et cetera. Hi, Donna Futterman from the Adolescent AIDS Program in the Bronx. And I want to follow up on the point that Jen was just making, which is rising new infections. One of the big problems we have, I think, is a institutional barrier that doesn't allow HRSA dollars to be used for testing. Um, I was at just at the, at the Ryan White meeting and, and filled with HRSA-funded programs who literally are told they can't use their dollars for testing. And then we have, you know, CDC, which can only use for testing, and then, you know, linkage to care sometimes falls in the middle. So I think the Affordable Care Act, one of its potential advantage is the sort of beginning to end care continuum. But I was wondering if people have ideas about how strategically we could work to address, identify, and eliminate some of the barriers within our current funding mechanisms. Well, you know, I mean, I, I think that there, there are provisions about prevention and public health funds, or there's, and public health, there's a fund for that. I'm not sure how it works, but I think we need to get our experts in there to look at that so that maybe we can bridge some of these gaps that, where we've been siloed for so many years. I mean, it's craziness the way things are funded or not funded here. So, I mean, that might be an opportunity to look at how we, you know, integrate prevention and public health sorts of issues in the care, a care model. I would just add a couple thoughts on this. Um, one is that as part of the ACA, there were some demonstration pilots uh, uh, that were available to apply for that would allow for some of that kind of pooled funding and, and, and really taking down those barriers. Um, there are a few different groups of individuals who are looking at that for HIV. I don't know if that ever moved forward, but that may be something to look at. I think beyond that, it, you're pointing to a real challenge with the current structures. Um, that could be reexamined, and I think a hope, hopeful sign, though, is that under the Medicaid, with the uh, what we found is that um, a huge number, about half of the states, are already providing routine HIV screening, so it's already part of what's provided in the the package. And assuming that that um, find that recommendation by the task force gets finalized, which it probably will, um, that will be uh, part of the incentive for states to increase, you know, to provide that, that full range of preventive services. So it will be more likely that people with HIV and people at risk are getting tested where they're getting, their, where they have coverage. But I agree with you that those are lines that we've, we've unfortunately built up around our, the HIV history that are hard to, to break down. I mean, the, the only thing I would add is, is that the whole idea behind the, accountable, the Affordable Care Act is to actually make providers more accountable, to encourage them to reorganize into these things called ACOs, accountable care organizations, in, in ways that they can provide soup to nuts services in a coordinated way. That's kind of the vision for what, what's supposed to happen here. But in my view, it's, it's, a, it's attainable, but it's a long-term vision. We can't do this overnight. We are organized in exactly the wrong way to be able to provide the team-based care that really will allow us to both address issues of, of person power, that is, do we have enough healthcare providers that can actually take care of these patients, uh, but also these larger issues of how do we make sure that the testing requirements under one grant don't prevent someone over here who desperately needs testing to not get it because we can't figure out how to get it paid for. Um, so I, I think there's long-term hope. The short-term, I'm a little bit not as hopeful. Number two. Hi, uh, I'm Sean Cahill from the Family Institute, and I have a question for any of the panelists um, related to the ACO model, Steve. Um, 
What opportunities exist within the new models of health care provision in the Affordable Care Act, like the Accountable Care Organization model, the patient-centered medical home model, to address the problems with the HIV treatment cascade, to improve HIV treatment outcomes, uh, and also to improve health care for LGBT people? And are there any elements of those two models that we should be you know, vigilant about or concerned about when it comes to HIV care in particular? I have a whole lecture on this, so I don't think you want to hear that. <laughs> Um, you know, my, uh, I, I think the Affordable Care Act and prospective payment is here uh, to stay, thanks to the Supreme Court and thanks to the last uh, election. I think uh, accountable care organizations are an intrinsic part of that uh, Affordable Care Act, and uh, that means we're going to have prospective payment of various sorts uh, for an increasing number of our patients into the future. In my view, we can argue a lot about how much those prospective payments are, and I think there's a lot of concern about that. Uh, things like risk adjust adjustment, risk quarters, reinsurance, a million different things that you have to think about. Because think about what's actually happening. The minute you start taking a prospective payment from an insurer or payer of any sort to actually care for a person uh, with a fairly significant illness, you are, in fact, transferring risk from that insurer to the provider. Now, you do that to varying degrees depending on what that model looks like, but that is what's happening. Now, the purpose in doing that is to try to control costs, to try to put downward pressure on the costs of care. And policymakers do not want to get involved at all in clinical decision making or how uh, clinicians of various sorts all decide how to work together and uh, provide integrated care. So they're basically handing this off to providers saying, you figure out how to make this work. And I think that's actually where the, the rubber meets the road. Because uh, I have uh, sat on a physician organization board of directors for now close to 16 years in one of the largest teaching hospitals in Boston. I will tell you, I, I'm a primary care clinician on that board. I am outnumbered about seven to one by specialists. And for those of you who are thinking specialists as opposed to procedural specialists, I'm talking about procedural specialists. So, um, so the, bo the bottom line is in any attempt to actually adjust uh, payment that goes to primary care, which is really the critical part of what we're talking about here, um, I argue that for the patient-centered medical home, you need about a 4% increase in payment to primary care. A four, now remember, out of every premium dollar we pay, 10 cents goes to primary care. So what we're talking about is 14 cents going to primary care to move this model and to actually be able to withdraw uh, Ryan White support for the model, which is in essence a patient-centered medical home model that we've already uh, created. Uh, I have been shot down every time by my own um, clinicians, my own partners uh, in this, because it is not in their interest to see dollars start to shift. And the Boston Globe just yesterday had a great article about how this is going to happen. So the neurologists suddenly are outraged that their EMG and nerve conduction study tests are now being significantly, well, moderately reduced uh, in payment based on Medicare. And remember, for most commercial payers, they base their rates on Medicare rates. So you get paid 143% of, of uh, 2012 Medicare, for example. So the minute those adjustments are made in Medicare, they start getting reflected in all of their contracts because that's the way these contracts have been negotiated. So the bottom line is pay, getting engaged in how we govern ourselves in these ACOs is the critical issue. If you, as I said before, if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. So you must be represented in those places or your interests and your patient's interests will not be represented where it matters. I just wanted to add one thing which also picks Here. back up on uh, Donna Fetterman's question. Um, and it's, since I'm talking to an audience about something on the domestic side, I'm gonna reference global examples. But when I talk about global AIDS, I'm always referencing domestic examples. So it's, um, neither is perfect, right? But one of the things that I think has occurred in the context of the global AIDS and global health discussion for the US government over the last four years has been integration. 
I'm not saying it's been successful, but there's been uh, the idea that integration was not happening and that it should happen is now part of the mantra of talking about US global, the U.S. global health response, the U.S. response to global AIDS. And the way it started was, you know, I think Secretary Clinton again and, and probably President Obama saying, you know, really at the end of the day, U.S. government programs are supporting an individual in the field. That individual has a need for HIV services, a need for malaria services, a need for family planning services, and because of all of these silos, we're literally sending that person from here to there. It's not efficient. It's not good for health outcomes. Let's focus on the individual. And I think that's part of the answer here. If we keep focus on the actual person that we're trying to reach to policymakers and others and talk about the need for that person to receive the panoply of services, support, and otherwise that they need, whether it's testing, whether it's linkage to care, et cetera, I think that helps move that conversation forward. So integration. So unless I'm missing someone with a question, let, let me ask another one. And you know, um, Steve started out, and, and when he gave his opening remarks, I heard him talk about risk adjustment. Now he just also spoke about some reimbursement issues. And I was thinking about the fact that I've been to Fenway Health, and it's an amazing place. It's like shiny and new, and it, in some ways, I think it's something that like the community can really be proud that they've created to, to care for people in their community. And if only we could replicate this everywhere, but we probably can't. But having said that. There are a lot of really strong HIV clinics across the country, lots of them. But I think in some ways I worry that you know, their future could be threatened. And if we could just presume for a second that Ryan White will continue, but we acknowledge that most Ryan White clients will have um, some sort of insurance coverage, so Ryan White will be supplementary. What's necessary to really ensure that these HIV clinics stay strong to the future? Like, What do you see as the biggest threats? Um, that threaten the you know the strength of these these um, the the healthcare infrastructure we have across the country. Well, I think it is just that the infrastructure you cannot pay for medical case management, transportation, um, a lot of the things that we do with the uh, Ryan White funds is just not there. You can't do it because you know if you get sixty four dollars for your Medicare visit and your Medicaid pays forty seven percent of that, so you're getting about $40 for your Medicaid patient, you, you can't see enough people in the current fee for service. So I think there has to be some way, and perhaps the patients that are in medical home with uh, uh, some sort of a capitation add-on to a, a fee for service, which is what they're looking at, uh, if you can get that, then you might be able to maintain what Ryan White has built, because those very good clinics uh, are because of case management, they're because of wraparound services, they're because of, of peer navigators and all the things that we can provide through the Ryan White funds. But if that goes away, you're not going to be able to, no matter how much billing you do, you're not going to do a lot of collecting. And this population has many more needs, I think, in terms of social needs than a lot of our population. So there's got to be a way of helping maintain that infrastructure. You know, I've seen a lot of linkage to care grants lately for community organizations to get people tested, to get them in care, to keep them in care, mostly to get them in care. We're starting to talk more about keep them in care. But you know, if we talk about integration, I mean, not only for small clinics, but you know, I think about Hopkins too. Um, we're all going to have to work together, and I think it would behoove all organizations to do what they do best. Uh, and to work together, if some of the community organizations are charged with linking people to care, then hospitals are going to have to hook up with them to get services provided for transportation or whatever, things that they may have, even a little bit of money. And people like us are good with doing a lot of things with a little bit of money. I mean, I think if we could work together like that, that's probably the hardest of all, you know, for a little organization to work with a big Hopkins, for instance, although you make it easier, JB. But I'm just saying, I mean, there, are, there is going to be a little bit of money for the kind of stuff that you're talking about, maybe not in the way we're used to looking at it, but I mean, we're really going to have to think about outside the box here and do things creatively and differently. You know, I was listening to a, uh, a New York Times ad for all these apps and all this stuff, and, and I remember how they almost lost the paper because they weren't thinking ahead. So if we don't want to lose our organizations, our hospital, you know, um, uh, groups for this, the Moore Clinic, for instance, or small organizations. We're going to have to learn how to come together to do some of this stuff together. Anybody else? 
So I think we're towards the close. So I'm going to ask one last question and really use this to, for people to maybe give some wrap-up comments. And one observation that I could make is that there's so much that we have to do. It could almost be immobilizing. Are we going to focus on the federal level, the state level? Are we going to worry about Medicaid expansion? Are we going to get all these people with HIV enrolled? Are we going to focus on entry and linkage? And we've got to do all those things, but in some cases we, we've got to focus too. So I guess I would ask the panelists whether what's your one thing that you think is most urgent or your sort of short list. If like for the audience to take away, right now focus on these one or two things, what would they be? Who wants to go first? I guess I will. Um, so I'll throw out one. Um, the Ryan White Care Act funding, I don't care whether the act itself is reauthorized, but the funding that's associated with it must continue in my view, for at least a five to seven year period of time after we start the, well, now, from now. Uh, once it expires, we need one more, f at least five year period of time of funding that can help bridge um, what's about to kind of affect all of us in terms of the, the healthcare system. Um, you know, for me, I mean, I'm an advocate, so for me, it's advocacy, and I mean, that's a big word, and we've talked about a whole lot of different arenas, but I think we need a, a, a big push to, to get this Affordable Care Act off the ground with the integration and all the kind of stuff that, that we've been talking about. Uh, as for advocacy, please, you know, see this on your, on your table. Please sign up to get letters, uh, you know, to get a form letter or to sign on a, a sign-on letter, but, you know, let's make our first advocacy push for something today, okay? So I would really appreciate if you, all you need to do is sign your name and give your email address and we can send you a form letter that you can just shoot out. But the other thing for me, I mean, I'm a research treatment advocate, uh, advocate and for me it's drugs and, and, you know, I love to, to work also with, you know, it's great to do these protocols and get these drugs approved, but if people can't get them, then what's good, what good is all the work you've done? So I will continue to work on getting drugs to people. Um, and if that means having to work with drug companies to make sure things happen and think about innovative groups like Harbor Path to do that, I mean, that's where I live and that's probably what I'll be doing, especially for hepatitis C. So for focusing in the near and short, mid, medium and longer term, Medicaid expansion. Um, that's all I, I want to say about it. It's, it's that important. Um, secondly, in the near term, regulations that have come out or are still coming out, that's a place where we, there's a lot of monitoring that needs to be done and input needed. Um, and then I think we're very currently in and will be increasingly in an implementation phase. So it's really about implementation. So whether whatever state you live in or, or, or community you are, it's implementation is going to happen, and that is a key should be a key focus. Donna, and I think I would just say keep the patient at the center of your focus, and with whatever you're advocating, make sure that you have them with you, around you, and understanding what it is that you think they need, but make sure they think they need it and that they're willing to go to bat with you because advocacy doesn't work very well unless you have the people you're advocating for behind you. So whatever it is in your state or local jurisdiction that you're working at, make sure that there's buy-in from the population you're trying to care for. Thank you. So well, thank you very much for the whole panel. This was absolutely terrific and uh, this discussion will continue in the track D uh, breakout group where some of the same people will continue this discussion, but of course you can't all go to, track to that one. There's three other breakout groups as well. But we will reconvene then as a group at 5 p.m. for the poster session. Dinner starts here at 7, and uh, between 7 and 8 we'll just sort of be eating, but we do have Congresswoman Barbara Lee coming, and we also have the Medea presentation uh, starting at about 8 o'clock. So uh, happy breakouts, and we'll see you all back here in this room for dinner at 7. Thank you so much, Jeff and all the panelists.